Now there's going to be a jolly row. Chapter 8 Tell came striding along, Walter by his side, and his crossbow over his shoulder. He knew nothing about the hat having been placed on the pole, and he was surprised to see such a large crowd gathered in the meadow. He bowed to the crowd in his polite way, and the crowd gave three cheers and one more, and he bowed again. "'Hello,' said Walter suddenly. "'Look at that hat up there, father, on the pole.' Oh, "'What is the hat to us?' said Tell, and he began to walk across the meadow with an air of great dignity, and Walter walked by his side, trying to look just like him. "'Here, hi!' shouted the soldiers. "'Stop! You haven't bowed down to the cap!' Tell looked scornful, but said nothing. Walter looked still more scornful. "'Ho, there!' shouted Frieshardt, standing in front of him. "'I bid you stand in the Emperor's name!' "'My good fellow,' said Tell, "'please do not bother me. I am in a hurry.' I really have nothing for you. My orders is, said Frieshard, to stand in this here meadow, and to see as how all them what passes through it does obeisance to that there hat. Them's governor's orders, them is. So now. My good fellow, said Tell, let me pass. I shall get cross, I know I shall. Shouts of encouragement from the crowd, who were waiting patiently for the trouble to begin. "'Go it, Tell!' they cried. "'Don't stand talking to him! Hit him a kick!' Frieshard became angrier every minute. "'My orders is,' he said again, "'to arrest them as don't bow down to the hat, and for two pins, young feller, I'd arrest you. So which is it to be?' Either you bow down to that there hat, or you come along of me. Tell pushed him aside, and walked on with his chin in the air. Walter went with him, with his chin in the air. Whack! A howl of dismay went up from the crowd as they saw Frieshart raise his pike, and bring it down with all his force on Tell's head. The sound of the blow went echoing through the meadow, and up the hills and down the valleys. "'Ow!' cried Tell. "'Now,' thought the crowd, "'things must begin to get exciting.' Tell's first idea was that one of the larger mountains in the neighbourhood had fallen on top of him. Then he thought that there must have been an earthquake. Then it gradually dawned upon him that he had been hit by a mere common soldier with a pike. Then he was angry. "'Look here!' he began. "'Look there!' said Frieshardt, pointing to the cap. "'You've hurt my head very much,' said Tell. "'Feel the bump. If I hadn't happened to have a particularly hard head, I don't know what might not have happened.' and he raised his fist and hit Frieshardt. But as Frieshardt was wearing a thick iron helmet, the blow did not hurt him very much. But it had the effect of bringing the crowd to Tell's assistance. They had been waiting all this time for him to begin the fighting, for though they were very anxious to attack the soldiers, they did not like to do so by themselves. They wanted a leader. So when they saw Tell hit Frieshardt, they tucked up their sleeves, grasped their sticks and cudgels more tightly, and began to run across the meadow towards him. Neither of the soldiers noticed this. Frieshardt was very busy arguing with Tell, and Luthold was laughing at Frieshardt. So when the people came swarming up with their sticks and cudgels, they were taken by surprise. But every soldier in the service of Gessler was as brave as a lion, and Frieshardt and Luthold were soon hitting back merrily, and making a good many of the crowd wish they had stayed at home. The two soldiers were wearing armour, of course. 
so that it was difficult to hurt them, but the crowd, who wore no armour, found that they could get hurt very easily. Conrad Hun, for instance, was attacking Frieshart, when the soldier happened to drop his pike. It fell on Conrad's toe, and Conrad limped away, feeling that fighting was no fun unless you had thick boots on. And so, for a time, the soldiers had the best of the fight. End of chapter 8 Chapter 9 For many minutes the fight raged furiously round the pole, and the earth shook beneath the iron boots of Frieshard and Luthold as they rushed about, striking out right and left with their fists and the flats of their pikes. Seppi the cowboy, an ancestor, by the way, of Buffalo Bill, went down before a tremendous blow by Frieshard, and Luthold knocked Klaus von der Flue head over heels. "'What do you want?' said Arnold of Sewa, who had seen the beginning of the fight from the window of his cottage, and had hurried to join it, and, as usual, to give advice to everybody. "'What you want here is guile. That's what you want. Guile. Cunning. Not brute force, mind you. It's no good rushing at a man in armour and hitting him. He only hits you back. You should employ guile. Thus, observe. He had said these words standing on the outskirts of the crowd. He now grasped his cudgel and began to steal slowly towards Frieshart, who had just given Verney the huntsman such a hit with his pike that the sound of it was still echoing in the mountains and was now busily engaging in disposing of Jost Weiler. Arnold of Siwa crept stealthily behind him, and was just about to bring his cudgel down on his head, when Luthold, catching sight of him, saved his comrade by driving his pike with all his force into Arnold's side. Arnold said afterwards that it completely took his breath away. He rolled over, and after being trodden on by everybody for some minutes, got up and limped back to his cottage, where he went straight to bed, and did not get up for two days. All this time Tell had been standing a little way off with his arms folded, looking on. While it was a quarrel simply between himself and Frieshart, he did not mind fighting. But when the crowd joined and he felt it was not fair to help so many men attack one, however badly that one might have behaved, he now saw that the time had come to put an end to the disturbance. He drew an arrow from his quiver, placed it in his crossbow, and pointed it at the hat. Frieshard, seeing what he intended to do, uttered a shout of horror and rushed to stop him. But at that moment somebody in the crowd hit him so hard with a spade that his helmet was knocked over his eyes, and before he could raise it again, the deed was done. Through the cap, and through the pole, and out at the other side sped the arrow. And the first thing he saw when he opened his eyes was Tell, standing beside him twirling his moustache, while all around the crowd danced and shouted, and threw their caps into the air with joy. "'A mere trifle,' said Tell modestly. The crowd cheered again and again. Frieshart and Luthold lay on the ground beside the pole, feeling very sore and bruised, and thought that perhaps, on the whole, they had better stay there. There was no knowing what the crowd might do after this, if they began to fight again. So they lay on the ground and made no attempt to interfere with the popular rejoicings. What they wanted, as Arnold de Siwa might have said if he had been there, was a few moments' complete rest. Luthold's helmet had been hammered with sticks until it was over his eyes and all out of shape, and Frieshart's was very little better. And they both felt just as if they had been run over in the street by a horse and cart. "'Tell!' shouted the crowd. 
Hurrah for Tell! Good old Tell! Tell's the boy! roared Ulrich the Smith. Not another man in Switzerland could have made that shot. No! shrieked everybody. Not another! Speech! cried someone from the edge of the crowd. Speech! Speech! Tell speech! Everybody took up the cry. <laughs> no, no, said Tell, blushing. Go on, go on, shouted the crowd. Oh, I couldn't, said Tell. I don't know what to say. Anything will do. Speech! Speech! Ulrich the smith and Ruodi the fisherman hoisted Tell onto their shoulders, and having coughed once or twice, he said, <clears throat> Gentlemen! Cheers from the crowd. Gentlemen! said Tell again. This is the proudest moment of my life. More cheers. I don't know what you want me to talk about. I have never made a speech before. Excuse my emotion. This is the proudest moment of my life. Today is a great day for Switzerland. We have struck the first blow of the revolution. Let us strike some more. Shouts of, Hear, hear! from the crowd, many of them, misunderstanding Tell's last remark, proceeded to hit Luthold and Friesart, until stopped by cries of, Order! from Ulrich the Smith. Gentlemen, continued Tell, the floodgates of revolution have been opened. From this day they will stalk through the land, burning to ashes the slough of oppression which our tyrant governor has erected in our midst. I have only to add that this is the proudest moment of my life, and— He was interrupted by a frightened voice. "'Look out, you chaps!' said the voice. "'Here comes the governor!' Gessler, with a bodyguard of armed men, had entered the meadow and was galloping towards them. CHAPTER Ten. Gessler came riding up on his brown horse, and the crowd melted away in all directions, for there was no knowing what the governor might not do if he found them plotting. They were determined to rebel and to throw off his tyrannous yoke, but they preferred to do it quietly and comfortably when he was nowhere near. So they ran away to the edge of the meadow and stood there in groups, waiting to see what was going to happen. Not even Ulrich the smith and Ruodi the fisherman waited, though they knew quite well that Tell had not nearly finished his speech. They set the orator down, and began to walk away, trying to look as if they had been doing nothing in particular, and were going to go on doing it, only somewhere else. Tell was left standing alone in the middle of the meadow by the pole. He scorned to run away like the others, but he did not at all like the look of things. Gessler was a stern man, quick to punish any insult, and there were two of his soldiers lying on the ground with their nice armour all spoiled and dented, and his own cap on top of the pole had an arrow right through the middle of it, and would never look the same again, however much it might be patched. It seemed to tell that there was a bad time coming. Gessler rode up and reined in his horse. "'Now then, now then, now then!' he said in his quick, abrupt way. "'What's this? What's this? What's this?' When a man repeats what he says three times, you can see that he is not in a good temper. Friesheart and Luthold got up, saluted, and limped slowly towards him. They halted beside his horse and stood to attention. The tears trickled down their cheeks. "'Come, come, come!' said Gessler. "'Tell me all about it!' And he patted Friesheart on the head. Friesheart bellowed. Gessler beckoned to one of his courtiers. "'Have you a handkerchief?' he said. 
I have a handkerchief, Your Excellency. Then dry this man's eyes. The courtier did as he was bidden. Now, said Gessler, when the drying was done, and Frieshard's tears had ceased, what has been happening here? I heard a cry of help as I came up. Who cried help? Please, your lordship's noble excellency ship, said Frieshard. It was me, Frieshard. You should say, it was I, said Gessler. Proceed. Which I am a loyal servant of your excellency's, and in your excellency's army, and seeing as how I was told to stand by this here pole and guard that there hat, I stood by this here pole and guarded that there hat. All day I did, Your Excellency. And when up comes this man here, and I says to him, Bow down to the hat, I says. Ho, he says to me. Ho, indeed. And he passed on without so much as nodding. So I takes my pike, and I taps him on the head to remind him, as you might say that there was something he was forgetting. And he ups and hits me, he does. And then the crowd runs up with their sticks and hits me and Luthold cruel, your excellency. And while we was a-fighting with them, this here man I'm a-telling you about, your excellency, he outs with an arrow, puts it into his bow, and sends it through the hat and I don't see how you'll ever be able to wear it again. It's a waste of a good hat, Your Excellency. That's what it is. And then the people, they puts me and Luthold on the ground, and hoist this here man, tell they call him, up on their shoulders, and he starts making a speech, when up you comes, Your Excellency. That's how it all was. Gessler turned pale with rage, and glared fiercely at Tell, who stood before him in the grasp of two of the bodyguard. Ah, he said, Tell, is it? Good day to you, Tell. I think we've met before, Tell. Eh, Tell? We have, Your Excellency. It was in the ravine of Che Shenthal, said Tell firmly. Your memory is good, Tell. So is mine. I think you made a few remarks to me on that occasion, Tell. A few chatty remarks. Eh, Tell? Very possibly, Your Excellency. You were hardly polite, Tell. If I offended you, I am sorry. I am glad to hear it, Tell. I think you will be even sorrier before long. So you've been ill-treating my soldiers, eh? It was not I who touched them. Oh, so you didn't touch them. Ah, but you defied my power by refusing to bow down to the hat. I set up that hat to prove the people's loyalty. I am afraid you are not loyal, Tell. I was a little thoughtless, not disloyal. I passed the hat without thinking. You should always think, Tell. It is very dangerous not to do so. And I suppose that you shot your arrow through the hat without thinking? I was a little carried away by excitement, Your Excellency. Dear, dear, carried away by excitement, were you? You must really be more careful, Tell. One of these days you will be getting yourself into trouble. But it seems to have been a very fine shot. You are a capital marksman, I believe. Father's the best in all Switzerland, piped a youthful voice. He can hit an apple on a tree a hundred yards away. I've seen him. Can't you, father? Walter, who had run away when the fighting began, had returned on seeing his father in the hands of the soldiers. Gessler turned a cold eye upon him. "'Who is this?' he asked. End of chapter 10
Chapter Eleven. It is my son Walter, your Excellency," said Tell. "Your son, indeed. This is very interesting. Have you any more children? I have one other boy. And which of them do you love the most, eh? I love them both alike, your Excellency. Dear me, quite a happy family. Now, listen to me, Tell. I know you are fond of excitement, so I am going to try to give you a little. Your son says that you can hit an apple on a tree a hundred yards away, and I am sure you have every right to be very proud of such a feat. Freeze heart. Your Excellency, bring me an apple. Frieshardt picked one up. Some apples had been thrown at him and Luthold earlier in the day, and there were several lying about. "'Which I'm afraid is how it's a little bruised, Your Excellency,' he said, having hit me on the helmet. "'Thank you. I do not require it for eating purposes,' said Gessler. "'Now, Tell, I have here an apple.' A simple apple, not overripe. I should like to test that feat of yours. So take your bow, I see you have it in your hand, and get ready to shoot. I am going to put this apple on your son's head. He will be placed a hundred yards away from you, and if you do not hit the apple with your first shot, your life shall pay forfeit." and he regarded Tell with a look of malicious triumph. "'Your Excellency, it cannot be!' cried Tell. "'The thing is too monstrous. Perhaps Your Excellency is pleased to jest. You cannot bid a father shoot an apple from off his son's head. Consider, Your Excellency!' "'You shall shoot the apple from off the head of this boy,' said Gessler sternly. I do not jest. That is my will. The sooner would I die, said Tell. If you do not shoot, you die with the boy. Come, come, Tell, why so cautious? They always told me that you loved perilous enterprises, and yet when I give you one, you complain. I could understand anybody else shrinking from the feet. But you, hitting apples at a hundred yards is child's play to you. And what does it matter where the apple is, whether it is on a tree or on a boy's head? It is an apple just the same. Proceed, Tell. The crowd, seeing a discussion going on, had left the edge of the meadow and clustered round to listen. A groan of dismay went up at the governor's words. "'Down on your knees, boy,' whispered Rudolph de Harris to Walter. "'Down on your knees, and beg His Excellency for your life.' "'I won't,' said Walter stoutly. "'Come,' said Gessler. "'Clear a path there, clear a path. Hurry yourselves. I won't have this loitering.' Look you, Tell, attend to me for a moment. I find you in the middle of this meadow deliberately defying my authority and making sport of my orders. I find you in the act of stirring up discontent among my people with speeches. I might have you executed without ceremony, but do I? No. Nobody shall say that Hermann Gessler the governor is not kind-hearted. I say to myself, I will give this man one chance. I place your fate in your own skilful hands. How can a man complain of harsh treatment when he is made master of his own fate? Besides, I don't ask you to do anything difficult. I merely bid you perform what must be to you a simple shot." You boast of your unerring aim. Now is the time to prove it. Clear the way there. Walter first flung himself on his knees before the governor. 
"'Your Highness,' he cried, "'none deny your power. Let it be mingled with mercy. It is excellent, as an English poet will say in a few hundred years, to have a giant's strength, but it is tyrannous to use it like a giant. Take the half of my possessions, but spare my son-in-law.' But Walter Tell broke in impatiently, and bade his grandfather rise, and not kneel to the tyrant. "'Where must I stand?' asked he. "'I'm not afraid. Father can hit a bird upon the wing.' "'You see that lime-tree yonder,' said Gessler to his soldiers. "'Take the boy, and bind him to it.' "'I will not be bound,' cried Walter. I am not afraid. I'll stand still. I won't breathe. If you bind me, I'll kick. Let us bind your eyes, at least, said Rudolf de Harris. Do you think I fear to see father shoot? said Walter. I won't stir an eyelash. Father, show the tyrant how you can shoot. He thinks you're going to miss. Isn't he an old donkey? "'Very well, young man,' muttered Gessler. "'We'll see who is laughing five minutes from now.' And once more he bade the crowd stand back, and leave a way clear for Tell to shoot. Chapter 12 The crowd fell back, leaving a lane down which Walter walked, carrying the apple. There was dead silence as he passed. Then the people began to whisper excitedly to one another. "'Shall this be done before our eyes?' said Arnold of Melchthal to Werner Stauffacher. "'Of what use was it that we swore an oath to rebel if we permit this? Let us rise and slay the tyrant.' Werner Stauffacher, prudent man, scratched his chin thoughtfully. "'Well,' he said, "'you see, the difficulty is that we are not armed, and the soldiers are. There is nothing I should enjoy more than slaying the tyrant. Only I have an idea that the tyrant would slay us. You see my point?' "'Why were we so slow?' groaned Arnold. We should have risen before, and then this would never have happened. Who was it that advised us to delay?" "'Well,' said Stauffacher, who had himself advised delay, "'I can't quite remember at the moment, but I dare say you can find out by looking up the minutes of our last meeting. I know the motion was carried by a majority of two votes. See." Gessler grows impatient. Gessler, who had been fidgeting on his horse for some time, now spoke again, urging Tell to hurry. "'Begin!' he cried. "'Begin!' "'Immediately,' replied Tell, fitting the arrow to the string. Gessler began to mock him once more. "'You see now,' he said. The danger of carrying arms. I don't know if you have ever noticed it, but arrows very often recoil on the man who carries them. The only man who has any business to possess a weapon is the ruler of a country. Myself, for instance. A low, common fellow, if you will excuse the description, like yourself, only grows proud through being armed, and so offends those above him. But, of course, it's no business of mine. I am only telling you what I think about it. Personally, I like to encourage my subjects to shoot. That is why I am giving you such a splendid mark to shoot at. You see, Tell? Tell did not reply. He raised his bow and pointed it. There was a stir of excitement in the crowd, more particularly in that part of the crowd which stood on his right, for, his hand trembling for the first time in his life, Tell had pointed his arrow, 
not at his son, but straight into the heart of the crowd. "'Here! Hi, that's the wrong way! More to the left!' shouted the people in a panic, while Gessler roared with laughter, and bade tell shoot and chance it. "'If you can't hit the apple or your son,' he chuckled, "'you can bring down one of your dear fellow countrymen.' Tell lowered his bow, and a sigh of relief went through the crowd. "'My eyes are swimming,' he said. "'I cannot see.' Then he turned to the governor. "'I cannot shoot,' he said. "'Bid your soldiers kill me.' "'No,' said Gessler. "'No, Tell. That is not at all what I want.' If I had wished my soldiers to kill you, I should not have waited for a formal invitation from you. I have no desire to see you slain. Not at present. I wish to see you shoot. Come, Tell. They say you can do everything, and are afraid of nothing. Only the other day, I hear, you carried a man, one Baumgartner, that was his name, I think, across a rough sea and an open boat. You may remember it. I particularly wish to catch Baumgartner, Tell. Now, this is a feat which calls for much less courage. Simply to shoot an apple off a boy's head. A child could do it. While he was speaking, Tell had been standing in silence, his hands trembling and his eyes fixed, sometimes on the governor, sometimes on the sky. He now seized his quiver, and taking from it a second arrow, placed it in his belt. Gessler watched him, but said nothing. "'Shoot, father!' cried Walter from the other end of the lane. "'I'm not afraid!' "'Tell, calm again now raised his bow, and took a steady aim. Everybody craned forward, the front ranks in vain telling those behind that there was nothing to be gained by pushing. Gessler bent over his horse's neck and peered eagerly towards Walter. A great hush fell on all as Tell released the string. <laughs> went the string, and the arrow rushed through the air. A moment's suspense. And then a terrific cheer rose from the spectators. The apple had leaped from Walter's head, pierced through the center. End of chapter 12 Chapter 13 Intense excitement instantly reigned. Their suspense over, the crowd cheered again and again, shook hands with one another, and flung their caps into the air. Everyone was delighted, for everyone was fond of Tell and Walter. It also pleased them to see the governor disappointed. He had had things his own way for so long that it was a pleasant change to see him baffled in this manner. Not since Switzerland became a nation had the meadow outside the city gates been the scene of such rejoicings. Walter had picked up the apple with the arrow piercing it, and was showing it proudly to all his friends. "'I told you so,' he kept saying. "'I knew father wouldn't hurt me. Father's the best shot in all Switzerland.' "'That was indeed a shot,' exclaimed Ulrich the smith. It will ring through the ages. While the mountains stand will the tale of Tell the bowman be told. Rudolf de Harris took the apple from Walter and showed it to Gessler, who had been sitting transfixed on his horse. See, he said, the arrow has passed through the very centre. It was a master shot. It was very nearly a master Walter shot said Russelman the priest, severely, fixing the governor with a stern eye. Gessler made no answer. He sat looking moodily at Tell, who had dropped his crossbow and was standing motionless, 
still gazing in the direction in which the arrow had sped. Nobody liked to be the first to speak to him. "'Well,' said Rudolph to Harris, breaking an awkward silence, "'I suppose it's all over now. May as well be moving, eh?' He bit a large piece out of the apple, which he still held. Walter uttered a piercing scream as he saw the mouthful disappear. Up till now he had shown no signs of dismay, in spite of the peril which he had had to face. But when he watched Rudolph eating the apple, which he naturally looked upon as his own property, he could not keep quiet any longer. Rudolph handed him the apple with an apology, and he began to munch it contentedly. "'Come with me to your mother, my boy,' said Russelman. Walter took no notice, but went on eating the apple. Tell came to himself with a start, looked round for Walter, and began to lead him away in the direction of his home, deaf to all the cheering that was going on around him. Gessler leaned forward in his saddle. Tell, he said, a word with you. Tell came back. Your Excellency? Before you go, I wish you to explain one thing. A thousand, Your Excellency. No, only one. When you were getting ready to shoot at the apple, you placed an arrow in the string and a second arrow in your belt. A second arrow? Tell pretended to be very much astonished, but the pretense did not deceive the governor. Yes, a second arrow. Why was that? What did you intend to do with that arrow, Tell? Tell looked down uneasily and twisted his bow about in his hands. My lord, he said at last, it is a bowman's custom. All archers place a second arrow in their belt. No, Tell, said Gessler. I cannot take that answer as the truth. I know there was some other meaning in what you did. Tell me the reason without concealment. Why was it? Your life is safe, whatever it was, so speak out. Why did you take out that second arrow? Tell stopped fidgeting with his bow, and met the governor's eye with a steady gaze. "'Since you promise me my life, Your Excellency,' he replied, drawing himself up, "'I will tell you.' He drew the arrow from his belt and held it up. The crowd pressed forward, hanging on his words. "'Had my first arrow,' said Tell slowly, "'pierced my child, and not the apple,' This would have pierced you, my lord, had I missed with my first shot. Be sure, my lord, that my second would have found its mark. A murmur of approval broke from the crowd as Tell thrust the arrow back into the quiver, and faced the governor with folded arms and burning eyes. Gessler turned white with fury. Seize that man! he shouted. "'My lord, bethink you,' whispered Rudolph der Harris. "'You promised him his life. "'Tell, fly!' he cried. "'Tell did not move. "'Seize that man and bind him,' roared Gessler once more. "'If he resists, cut him down.' "'I shall not resist,' said Tell scornfully. I should have known the folly of trusting to a tyrant to keep his word. My death will at least show my countrymen the worth of their governor's promises. Not so, replied Gessler. No man shall say I ever broke my knightly word. I promised you your life, and I will give you your life. But you are a dangerous man, Tell, and against such must I guard myself. You have told me your murderous purpose. I must look to it that that purpose is not fulfilled. Life I promised you, and life I will give you. But of freedom I said nothing. In my castle at Kusnacht 
There are dungeons where no ray of sun or moon ever falls. Chained hand and foot in one of these, you will hardly aim your arrows at me. It is rash, Tell, to threaten those who have power over you. Soldiers, bind him and lead him to my ship. I will follow, and will myself conduct him to Kursnacht. The soldiers tied Tell's hands. He offered no resistance, and amidst the groans of the people he was led away to the shore of the lake where Gessler's ship lay at anchor. So, our last chance is gone, said the people to one another. Where shall we look now for a leader? Chapter 14 the castle of Kusnacht lay on the opposite side of the lake, a mighty mass of stone reared on a mightier crag, rising sheer out of the waves, which boiled and foamed about its foot. Steep rocks of fantastic shape hemmed it in, and many were the vessels that perished on these, driven thither by the frequent storms that swept over the lake. Gessler and his men, tell in their midst, bound and unarmed, embarked early in the afternoon at Fleulen, which was the name of the harbour where the governor's ship had been moored. Fleulen was about two miles from Kursnacht. When they had arrived at the vessel they went on board, and Tell was placed at the bottom of the hold. It was pitch dark, and rats scampered over his body as he lay. The ropes were cast off, the sails filled, and the ship made her way across the lake, aided by a favouring breeze. A large number of the Swiss people had followed Tell and his captors to the harbour, and stood gazing sorrowfully after the ship as it diminished in the distance. There had been whispers of an attempted rescue, but nobody had dared to begin it, and the whispers had led to nothing. Few of the people carried weapons, and the soldiers were clad in armour, and each bore a long pipe or a sharp sword. As Arnold of Siwa would have said, if he had been present, what the people wanted was prudence. It was useless to attack men so thoroughly able to defend themselves. Therefore the people looked on and groaned, but did nothing. For some time the ship sped easily on her way and through a calm sea. Tell lay below, listening to the trampling of the sailors overhead, as they ran about the deck, and gave up all hope of ever seeing his home and his friends again. But soon he began to notice that the ship was rolling and pitching more than it had been doing at first, and it was not long before he realized that a very violent storm had begun. Storms sprung up very suddenly on the lake, and made it unsafe for boats that attempted to cross it. Often the sea was quite unruffled at the beginning of the crossing, and was rough enough at the end to wreck the largest ship. Tell welcomed the storm. He had no wish to live if life met years of imprisonment in a dark dungeon of Castle Kusnacht. Drowning would be a pleasant fate compared with that. He lay at the bottom of the ship, hoping that the next wave would dash them on to a rock and send them to the bottom of the lake. The tossing became worse and worse. Upon the deck, Gessler was standing beside the helmsman, and gazing anxiously across the waters at the rocks that fringed the narrow entrance to the bay, a few hundred yards to the east of Castle Kusnacht. This bay was the only spot for miles along the shore at which it was possible to land safely. For miles on either side this coast was studded with great rocks, which would have dashed a ship to pieces in a moment. It was to this bay that Gessler wished to direct the ship. But the helmsman told him that he could not make sure of finding the entrance, so great was the cloud of spray which covered it. A mistake would mean shipwreck. "'My lord,' 
said the helmsman. I have neither strength nor skill to guide the helm. I do not know which way to turn. What are we to do? asked Rudolf der Harris, who was standing near. The helmsman hesitated. Then he spoke, eyeing the governor uneasily. "'Tell could steer us through,' he said. "'If your lordship would but give him the helm.' Gessler started. "'Tell,' he muttered. "'Tell.' The ship drew nearer to the rocks. "'Bring him here,' said Gessler. Two soldiers went down to the hold and released Tell. They bade him get up and come with them. Tell followed them on deck and stood before the governor. Tell, said Gessler. Tell looked at him without speaking. Take the helm, Tell, said Gessler, and steer the ship through those rocks into the bay beyond, or instant death shall be your lot. Without a word, Tell took the helmsman's place, peering keenly into the cloud of foam before him. To right and to left he turned the vessel's head, and to right again, into the very heart of the spray. They were right among the rocks now, but the ship did not strike on them. Quivering and pitching, she was hurried along, until of a sudden the spray cloud was behind her, and in front the calm waters of the bay. Gessler beckoned to the helmsman. "'Take the helm again,' he said. He pointed to Tell. "'Bind him,' he said to the soldiers. The soldiers advanced slowly, for they were loath to bind the man who had just saved them from destruction. But the governor's orders must be obeyed, so they came towards Tell, carrying ropes with which to bind him. Tell moved a step back. The ship was gliding past a lofty rock. It was such a rock as Tell had often climbed when hunting the chamois. He acted with the quickness of the hunter. Snatching up the bow and quiver which lay on the deck, he sprang on to the bulwark of the vessel, and with a mighty leap gained the rock. Another instant, and he was out of reach. Gessler roared to his bowmen. "'Shoot! Shoot!' he cried. The bowmen hastily fitted arrow to string. They were too late. Tell was ready before them. There was a hiss as the shaft rushed through the air, and the next moment Gessler the governor fell dead on the deck, pierced through the heart. Tell's second arrow had found its mark, as his first had done. End of chapter 14 Chapter 15 The Final Chapter There is not much more of the story of William Tell. The death of Gessler was a signal to the Swiss to rise in revolt, and soon the whole country was up in arms against the Austrians. It had been chiefly the fear of the governor that had prevented a rising before. It had been brewing for a long time. The people had been bound by a solemn oath to drive the enemy out of the country. All through Switzerland preparations for a revolution were going on, and nobles and peasants had united. Directly the news arrived that the governor was slain, meetings of the people were held in every town in Switzerland, and it was resolved to begin the revolution without delay. All the fortresses that Gessler had built during his years of rule were carried by assault on the same night. The last to fall was one which had only been begun a short time back, and the people who had been forced to help to build it spent a very pleasant hour pulling down the stones which had cost them such labor to put in their place. Even the children helped. It was a great treat to them to break what they pleased without being told not to. See, said Tell as he watched them, in years to come, when these same children are grey-haired, 
they will remember this night as freshly as they will remember it to-morrow. A number of people rushed up, bearing the pole which Gessler's soldiers had set up in the meadow. The hat was still on top of it, nailed to the wood by Tell's arrow. "'Here's the hat!' shouted Ruodi. "'The hat to which we were to bow!' "'What shall we do with it?' cried several voices. "'Destroy it! Burn it!' said others. "'To the flames with this emblem of tyranny!' But Tell stopped them. "'Let us preserve it,' he said. "'Gessler set it up to be a means of enslaving the country. We will set it up as a memorial of our newly gained liberty.' Nobly is fulfilled the oath we swore to drive the tyrants from our land. Let the pole mark the spot where the revolution finished. But is it finished? said Arnold of Melchthal. It is a nice point. When the Emperor of Austria hears that we have killed his friend Gessler, and burnt down all his fine new fortresses, will he not come here to seek revenge? He will, said Tell, and let him come, and let him bring all his mighty armies. We have driven out the enemy that was in our land. We will meet and drive away the enemy that comes from another country. Switzerland is not easy to attack. There are but a few mountain passes by which the foe can approach. We will stop these with our bodies, and one great strength we have. We are united. And united we need fear no foe. Hurrah! shouted everybody. But who is this that approaches? said Tell. He seems excited. Perhaps he brings news. It was Russellman the pastor, and he brought stirring news. These are strange times in which we live, said Russellman coming up. "'Why, what has happened?' cried everybody. "'Listen, and be amazed.' "'Why, what's the matter?' "'The Emperor?' "'Yes.' "'The Emperor is dead.' "'What? Dead?' "'Dead.' "'Impossible! How came you by the news?' "'John Muller of Schaffhausen brought it. And he is a truthful man. But how did it happen? As the emperor rode from Stein to Baden, the lords of Eschenbach and Tegerfelden, jealous, it is said, of his power, fell upon him with their spears. His bodyguard were on the other side of a stream. The emperor had just crossed it, and could not come to his assistance. He died instantly. By the death of the Emperor, the revolution in Switzerland was enabled to proceed without check. The successor of the Emperor had too much to do in defending himself against the slayers of his father to think of attacking the Swiss, and by the time he was at leisure they were too strong to be attacked. So the Swiss became free. As for William Tell, he retired to his home, and lived there very happily ever afterwards with his wife and his two sons, who in a few years became very nearly as skilful in the use of the crossbow as their father. That's the end of William Tell told again, but the original volume contained a rhyme story of William Tell, and this will conclude our narrative. The Swiss, against their Austrian foes, had ne'er a soul to lead em, till Tell, as you've heard Tell, arose and guided them to freedom. Tell's tale we tell again, an act for which pray no one scold us. This tale of Tell we tell, in fact, as this tell-tale was told us. Beneath a tyrant foreign yoke, how love of freedom waxes, especially when foreign folk come round collecting taxes. The Swiss, held down by Gessler's fist, 
would fain have used evasion, yet none there seemed who could resist his methods of persuasion. And pride so filled this guestler's soul, a monarch's pride outclassing, he stuck his hat up on a pole, that all might bow in passing. Then rose the patriot William Tell. We've grown neath Austrian sway first. Must we be ruled by Poles as well? I've just a word to say first. The crowd about the pole at morn used various persuaders. They flung old cans to prove their scorn of all tin-pot invaders. And cabbage stumps were freely dealt, and apples inexpensive and rotten eggs, to show they felt a foreign yoke offensive. Said William Tell, And has this cuss for conquest such a passion, he needs must set his cap at us in this exalted fashion? And then the people gave a cry, twixt joy and apprehension, to see him pass the symbol by with studied inattention. At first the sentinel, aghast, glared like an angry dumb thing. Then, hi, he shouted, not so fast, you're overlooking something. The sturdy tell made no response, then through the hills resounded a mighty thwack upon his sconce. The people were astounded. Could tell an insult such as this ignore or pass? <laughs> I doubt it. No, no, that patriotic Swiss was very cross about it. The people, interested now, exclaimed, "'Ere, stop a minute! If there's to be a jolly row, by jingo, we'll be in it!' Said Tell, "'This satrap of the Duke is sore in need of gumption. With my good bow I will rebuke such arrogant presumption.' "'Stand back!' The soldier says, says he, This roughness is unseemly. The people cried, We will be free, and so they were, extremely. They dealt that soldier thump on thump. He hadn't any notion, when on Tell's head he raised that bump of raising this commotion. Tell's arrow sped, the people crowed, and loudly cheered his action while Tell's expressive features showed a certain satisfaction. Now, when the cat's away, the mice are very enterprising. But cats return, and in a trice, well, Gessler nipped that rising, and when those soldiers lodged complaint, which truly didn't lack ground, the people practiced self-restraint and fell into the background. And tell, before the tyrant hailed, no patriot you'd have guessed him, for even his stout bosom quailed when Gessler thus addressed him. As you're the crack shot of these Swiss, I've often heard it said so. Suppose you take a shot at this, placed on your youngster's head, so. The bearing, as they say, of that lay in the application and nobody will wonder at a parent's agitation, that anguish filled tells bosom proud needs scarcely to be stated, and it will be observed the crowd was also agitated. Said Gessler, This is all my eye. Come hurry up and buck up. Remember, if you miss, you die. That ought to keep your pluck up. The flying arrow may, no doubt, your offspring's bosom enter. But here there rose a mighty shout. By George, he scored a center. But as the arrow cleft the core, cried Gessler with indignation, What was a second arrow for? Come, no we quiver, Cation. You had a second in your fist, said Tell the missile grippin. This shaft... Had I that apple missed, was meant for you, my Pippin. With rage the tyrant said, said he, It's time to stop this prating. I find your style of repartee extremely irritating. 
"'You'll hang for this, be pleased to note.' On this they bound and gagged him, for Gessler's castle booked by boat, and through the village dragged him. But slips between the cup and lip, when least expected, peer through. A storm arose upon the trip, which tell alone could steer through. Thus of all hands he quickly got, as you may see, the upper. At Gessler took a parting shot, and hurried home to supper. Some say the tale related here is amplified and twisted. Some say it isn't very clear that William Tell existed. Some say he freed his country so the governor demolished. Perhaps he did. I only know that taxes aren't abolished.'